Oh, a great honor to be here, great honor. I, I just love Audacious Church so much. I don't know about you, but I was standing in the middle of the worship today feeling like we could literally just raise dead people to life again. Just the spirit of faith that is in this house and the enthusiasm, um, our, our expectation for all that God is doing is just so tangible. And, and I hope in Chester this morning, you can sense it as well. Um, this is truly an important church on earth right now. Um, and every so often, God puts His hand upon a church, and he has, he has an intention that that church would be about more than just the lives that get impacted in it. And, and I don't know about you, but I am grateful. I mean, when I look around this auditorium, and, and I'm just aware that there's, there's thousands of testimonies here today. Um, there's people who, you know, could have been broken, but got healed. People have walked in the doors of this church feeling destitute and lonely and without a purpose. People had the crazy thoughts going through their head, but they came to this service, came to, the, to this church, and standing in services, they've had an encounter with Jesus, experienced the love of God through God's people. And because of that, now their lives have a purpose and a destiny. Come on, anybody out there could have been really broken, but God just put His hand on your life. How many people had their lives turned around here at Audacious in the last 11 years in some way? Put your hand up. Come on, lift it nice and high. Look, we've got hundreds and hundreds of hands going up right now of people who could have been broken, but they've had their, their lives turned around. And to be here on the 11th birthday, what a great delight it is. And I just know that for you, Audacious, you have just begun. I mean, we're, we're here 11 years. I, I came to the first anniversary of Audacious Church. The auditorium back then was the stage, was the size of the stage I'm standing on right now. I'm not joking. Some people have been here only a, a year or two and you're like, that can't be possible. No, 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 it's true. Sure, we had about 14 services in one day. <laughs> I, had, I had no voice and a serious case of dehydration by the end of the day, but, but we were literally meeting in an auditorium that was about this size. And now here we are in awe of God's goodness planning for the future, getting ready for the greatest days that are ahead. And I think this 11th birthday is in no way an inconsequential moment. It's a new beginning. We're going further than we've ever gone before. And I want to stir your faith, audacious. I woke up this morning, I had a message ready to go. And I felt like as I looked out the window of where I was um, sleeping overnight, I, I opened the curtains and I looked out. And I saw a little glimpse of, of the city of Manchester, a few blocks that were in front of me. And I felt like the Lord just spoken in my heart about your church. And I wanted to sort of share with you out of what I felt the Lord told me this morning, because I believe with all my heart that a great city needs a great church. And I believe Audacious is called to be that great church for a great city. Anybody believe Manchester is a great city? Anybody believe Audacious is a great church? Yeah. And I think God's got a, a plan to put those two together and to do something amazing through us. In fact, this is what I felt the Lord told me this morning. I felt like God said to me that Audacious is called to be an audacious English church. This is a church that is called to declare to England and to the United Kingdom that there are no limits, there are no ceilings, there is no stopping point. There is nothing that our God cannot do. We're not gonna be bound by religious conversion. We're not gonna be hemmed in by restrictive spirit. We're not gonna be limited by religion. Hello, anybody believe me apart from the front row? But we are going to be an audacious church. I believe God wants you to be a congregation of people like that of an Elisha generation who pick up the mantle of previous generations and say, if the Wesleyans can have a revival, if the William Booths can bring a revival, if a Charles Spurgeon can bring a revival, then why not now? Why not in our time? Why not in our day? If you believe God isn't finished with the United Kingdom, then give Him some praise right now. Come on. We're gonna be an audacious church. We tell the devil you don't have us. We tell every limit that you will not bind us. Come on, we say to every obstacle in our way that we are greater than you because Jesus is on our side. Come on, if you believe it, for three seconds, give God some praise right now. Our God is on our side. 
Just tap the person next to you and say, greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Come on. Come on. I believe that this is a, a season where for you as Audacious Church, you're about to step into this next year will be a year of rapid progress. And I'm prophesying over you today that you're gonna see things begin to rapidly unfold. You know, there are seasons. Back home in New Zealand, it's our spring. I know it's the other way here in the Northern Hemisphere, but right now it's our spring. We're building up to summer. And I've been away a lot over the last month or five weeks. And every time I come home to my house, I see new growth. My lawn has grown by two inches. The plants have blossomed and are flourishing because it's in a season where things begin to happen rapidly. Audacious, you are stepping into a season where things are gonna begin to happen rapidly. God is getting ready to move you forward in an amazing way. I believe this next season of your church is gonna be a season of fast progress. This building that we are preparing to build, what a great building. You know, I believe with all my heart that God is gonna open up doors for you, cause this vision to come to pass. I was looking at the, uh, the, 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 the model in the foyer here in Manchester, so inspired by it. I've dreamed over the plans with you, prayed over the Instagram pictures on your pastor's feeds. And I believe with all my heart that we need to see a testimony to the greatness of God established here in Manchester. Manchester needs to know that Jesus is alive and moving, amen? We opened last year the Arise Centre in Wellington, New Zealand, and this beautiful building is right on the edge of what we call State Highway 2. It'd be like maybe the M2 in, in our city. I don't know how it works, but anyway, it's the second most significant motorway. We have, we have the building right on the side of it. 30,000 cars a day make their way past that building. It is lit up all night by LED lights that light the building throughout the night for $1 an hour. And cars come past it every every day. What has happened now is that every time I go into a supermarket, a service station, a dairy, a clothing store or a restaurant, it's impossible to find people who haven't seen the building and recognise our church. And I'm just so excited that the, the building that won the architecture award for our city last year was a church. Uh, 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 the, the, the building that won the building of the year for our nation of New Zealand was a church. I just believe with all my heart that we need to make a statement. How many people, people believe that the church is not supposed to just be in a little old auditorium built a hundred years ago? It's supposed to be in modern facilities, purpose built, not for the entertainment of the masses, but for the glory of our great God and the salvation of a community. Come on, I believe we need to take ground back for the Kingdom of God. Come on, I'm preaching better than you're responding. Somebody shout Amen. amen. We're going to build a building that's going to be a beacon of light, a city set upon a hill, a declaration to our community that Jesus is alive in Manchester. Do you believe that today? I believe that as we're starting these new locations, next weekend we begin the first of two new locations here for Manchester. And I believe you're gonna break out to the left and to the right. I believe as we're starting these new locations, this one is full for the second time this morning. Where do you wanna sit? Right down the foyer, we need more room. And as we're launching these new locations, I believe that God's gonna increase the size of the net of audacious and allow it to be spread further so that many, many more thousands of people can be one for God. This is an amazing church, an incredible journey that you've been on, but we must continue to take new steps. And this is gonna be a season of rapid progress for you. And I believe God's saying to people in this auditorium, get ready, get ready, get ready, because there are new roles, there are new steps, there are new days, and your God has more for you than you have seen yet. Oh, if I have one mission, it is that by the time I'm finished today, your expectation is going to be that the greatest things you have seen God do are not yet, you haven't seen the greatest things God's got for you yet, but in the coming days, you will stand in awe of the glory of God. This is only just the beginning. This is merely a tithe on the substance of what, this is the first fruit, but God's got a whole harvest. This is the first fruit, but God has a whole harvest for us. If you believe that, shout amen today. 
And I believe that God is getting ready to take us into a new, a new environment and to go a new way. Um, audacious, I just wanted to say over you that the beat people in this auditorium that have walked through seasons of difficulty and of struggle. And I do believe that there have been for individuals and maybe even you felt at, at, at times as a church that you faced spiritual opposition. But I believe that this is a season for you as a church of fresh breakthrough. I don't know about you, but standing in the praise and worship this morning, you could not help but sense the freedom of the presence of God. Did you sense it? And we are, we are in a new day and in a new season. And I felt like God say to me this morning that the, the attack has been broken, that you have persevered in the face of obstacles, that you've endured. And I wanted to say firstly, just how much I love and appreciate your pastors who will not bow in the face of opposition or challenge or difficult days, but have walked this church through every moment to lead it to what it is now. Oh sure, it's amazing right now. But let me just tell you anything. Every parent knows you take a Kodak photo on a good moment, but normally that was preceded by a night with no sleep. How many parents know what I'm talking about? You lead a church into good seasons like we're in right now. It's only because somebody decided to persevere when it would have been easier to walk away or to quit, right? And I think we should just thank God for the leadership, for your pastors and all of the leadership team that have persevered through every moment, have delivered us a great victory right now. And we're getting ready for all that God has in the coming days ahead. Come on, somebody say amen and somebody give God some praise in this place today. All right, I gotta, get, I gotta get into the Word. I've wasted too much time just, just kind of declaring out what I feel, but I believe that this church, Audacious, is a monumentally important church on earth. I really do believe it. And like I've been telling you, all up and down this nation, people have been inspired because of you. If you have a Bible, let's go to the book of 2 Kings, the book of 2 Kings, chapter three. And I wanna start reading to you today from verse 14. 2 Kings chapter three and verse 14. Elisha said, as surely as the Lord Almighty lives whom I serve. If I did not have respect for the presence of Jehoshaphat, King of Judah, I would not look at you nor even notice you. But now bring me a harpist. While the harpist was playing, the hand of the Lord came upon Elisha and he said, this is what the Lord says, make this valley full of ditches. Make this valley full of ditches. For this is what the Lord says, you will see neither wind nor rain, yet this valley will be filled with water and you, your cattle and your other animals will drink. This is an easy thing in the eyes of the Lord. He will also hand Moab over to you. You will overthrow every fortified city and every major town. You will cut down every good tree, stop up all the springs and ruin every good field with stones. The next morning, about the time of the offering for offering the sacrifice, there it was, there it was. Water flowing from the direction of Edom and the land was filled with water. I wanna talk to you this morning, audacious, around the simple thought, make this valley full of ditches. Make this valley full of ditches. In this incredible passage of Scripture that we're reading from, we have three kings who unite together to go out to battle. They are the king of Israel, the king of Judah, and the king of Edom. And they unite together to go to war against the kingdom of Moab. They set out on a journey and as they're setting out to go to battle, the question is asked amongst the three, which way should we go? The king of Israel said, we should go up to battle through the wilderness of Moab. So they set out that direction and they go through the wilderness as they start their journey. They have an entire army, they have supporting animals that are carrying their supplies, and they have the, the animals that they are one day going to eat. And they set off on this journey together. They march through the wilderness for the first day. They march through the wilderness for the second day. Ahead of them is the promise of great victory that if they can beat Moab, then they will be more prosperous. If they can take this next step, 
then they will know greater influence. If they can win this battle, if they can make this progress point, then everything in their lives is going to be better. I want you to understand that that's the way it works in life. You and I are called by God to continue to take steps. We are never called to sit where we are. If we are Christian believers, then our life is supposed to be one of continual advancing. We are not sitters of Jesus, we are followers of Jesus. We do not spend our time staying where we are, we are changed, we progress, we take steps, we move forward. Why? Because as long as there is a hell with somebody in it, there needs to be a church that is advancing against it. Come on, somebody say amen. Oh, why does the church keep having to declare a new vision? Because hell's still got too many people in it. Come on. Why do we have to continue to sacrifice and move forward? Because we must plunder hell and we must populate heaven. Because we are declaring over Manchester and over the United Kingdom, drug addiction has had its day. Youth suicide has had its day. Marital divorce has had its day. Abuse has had its day. It is time for the love of Jesus to have its season in the lives of people that are loved by our Creator. Come on, if you believe that, give God some praise and shout a little amen or something. We gotta keep moving. We gotta keep moving. We gotta keep advancing. We gotta keep pressing forward. And I believe that this is a season where we as a church are gonna progress forward. But the Bible tells us that they set off on this journey and they went for one day in the wilderness and they went for two days in the wilderness. They they go for three days in the wilderness and they have still found no water. Four days in the wilderness, five days in the wilderness and they have found no water. I don't know about you, but I love being hydrated hate being dehydrated. And here we've got a group of people making their way through the wilderness and the further they walk through the wilderness, the more dehydrated they are becoming. Their energy is fading. Their enthusiasm is waning. Their their expectation is slowly diminishing away. As they get further and further away from the last moment in their life that they had a drink of water. And by the way, can I just pause and say that you sometimes meet people who just literally haven't drunk from the well of salvation for so long, who haven't been around an environment where they've discovered life and freedom that only Jesus can give for so long that we're looking at a dehydrated generation. And I just believe that if we can give people the opportunity to know that life again, that drink again, then we can see the lights go on. How many people just have seen people that the lights are off, the the, the eyes are open, but nobody's home. But I believe we're gonna revive a generation. We're gonna revive a community. We're gonna revive a lost and a broken soul. And there's more in them than their dehydration can let us see right now. Anybody know somebody that needs to have their life turned around? I think it's time for us to declare that we're going to bring water to this generation. Been traveling for a long time. Enthusiasm is waning. Five days, six days. After seven days, they are right at the edge of their battle with the Moabite people. They are in a valley. There is a hill. On the other side of the hill is the Moabite camp. As they're in this valley, they are on the edge of their battle, yet they have been seven days without any water. The Bible tells us that the king of Israel, now Israel at this point is divided into two kingdoms, the kingdom of Judah and the kingdom of Israel. And Judah is led by Jehoshaphat and Jehoshaphat is a worshiper. Now I want you to understand that in good days, it's very hard to discern the religious from the truly worshipful heart. It's hard in days when everything is going good to tell the difference between someone that's a churchian and someone who is a Christian. It's hard when everything is looking good to tell the difference between someone whose religion is about occupying a seat on a Sunday and someone whose relationship is about allowing God to take central place in their lives. Hello? But in this moment, we have the churchian, we have the religious man, the king of Israel. Literally, he just says, what? 
Did God bring us all the way out here only to have us handed over to the people of Moab? Have we come all this way for everything to come tumbling down? And friends, I want you to understand that the reason why this situation existed was only because God had them on a journey to get them to a place where something miraculous could happen. And you need to know, and I need to know about the journey of our lives that God cares more about where He is taking us than about the comfort of every step we take along the way. That if God's gonna do something supernatural in your life, we should not presume that something supernatural is preceded by every day being an easy day. Hello? The reason why we experience the supernatural is normally because the natural is not giving us what we need. Am I talking to anyone today? That's why, that's why the Israelites went through Egypt in order to get to the promised land. God let them be slaves in order to make them more than conquerors. Sometimes you're facing opposition in your now, not because God has left you, but because God is moving you. Am I talking to anybody? I mean, God allowed Jesus to come through a teenage girl in order to get to this earth. He took him through a cross in order to get him to victory for you and for me. God cares more clearly about our journey, about our destiny than He does about the route that He takes us to get us there. And if you're going through difficulty today, I just want you to understand that you might be facing opposition and in the middle of struggle, but know this, your God has not left you alone. If you're going through difficulty, it's only to get you to your destiny and what looks like a mess is gonna end up being your message. And if you believe it, give God about five seconds of praise. Come on. Make this valley full of ditches. Make this valley full of ditches. The Bible tells us that after seven days, tongues are hanging out of mouths. Soldiers are wallowing around. Sheep and cattle are now just lying around on the ground. They've run out of the will to live. Seven days without a sip of water, seven days without anything that looked optimistic. Have you ever been in a season in your life where it just feels like you're on your last breath and you don't even know whether you've got the strength to take it? That's where Israel is at. And in this amazing moment where everybody is singing the dirge and everyone has lost perspective and it all looks like it's about to come to an end, the King Jehoshaphat says, listen, is there anybody here that's a prophet of God? And this group of people that have been on a journey for seven days ask a new question, begin to do something that they haven't yet done. Isn't it amazing how in our lives, sometimes we can be in the middle of a problem, yet the way we're facing the problem is more of a problem than the problem. They are here thinking everything is terrible. Their report is that we're about to die. The feelings that they're feeling are of exhaustion. And suddenly a guy says, is there a prophet of God amongst us? Is there anybody here with the Word of the Lord? See, sometimes in our lives, it is what occupies our focus that is bigger than the problem itself. We're looking at the size of the problem rather than looking for the hand of our God. Hello? Elijah climbed up a mountain after a three-year drought and saw a cloud the size of a man's hand and knew that his prayers would be answered. All you need is a seed and it can get you through whatever difficulty you're facing. Anybody grateful that no matter what my trial might be, no matter what my difficulty might be, I've got a place where I can get a prophetic promise and it's called the Word of God. It is with me in every valley. It is with me in all desert. It is there to sustain me no matter how dry the drought may be. Somebody give God some praise. Say, come on, whack the person next to you and say, God's got a Word for you. God's got a Word for you. They begin searching for a prophet and the Bible tells us that, that they find Elisha. Elisha was in their midst. I want you to understand there are more things going for you in the middle of what you're facing than you understand right now. Oh, you've got to understand it. If you get a different perspective, if you'd, you'd take the worship and wonder with which you approach the service and carry it to your problem, you're gonna discover that you've got more with you than you realised up until now. Hello, am I talking to anybody? 
I think there's about 300 people who came to the service today who need to get a new search going on. When you walk out of this, you need an olive leaf in your mouth. You need a little promise from God that you're carrying into every situation. Your family's about to turn around. That child is about to come back to Jesus. That situation, you're about to get that job. God's going to open up the windows of heaven. There is a healing promise for your body in the mighty name of Jesus. And if you believe it, stand to your feet and give God about five seconds of praise in this building right now. Our God is able. Someone shout amen. Our God is with us. Someone shout yes. Oh my gosh, I believe with all my heart that our God isn't finished yet. Make this valley full of ditches. Make this valley full of ditches. The prophet begins to, is summoned by the people and he says, listen, can we get a harpist? Can we get a harpist? Can we change the environment around here? I mean, everybody's moaning, everybody's whinging, anybody got a workplace like that? Everybody's whinging, everybody's whining, everybody's complaining, everybody's thinking that their life is about to end. And in the middle of that environment, we've got a prophet who says, can we get a harpist? Can we get a happy person? Can we get rid of this melancholy? Can we begin to sing a new song? I mean, even Jesus doesn't like certain music, guys. Jesus, Jesus. Jesus turned up at a home. There's a dead girl who needs to be raised back to life again. And the first thing Jesus said was shut the team of, of musicians up. I need to get somebody with some faith in their mouth. What I love about an audacious church is that this is not a church where you're invited to sing a song of pity and mourning. This is a church that demands of you and I that in the darkness of our night, in the depths of our trial, that we begin like Job to go, though He slay me, yet will I praise Him. Though I walk through the valley, I will fear no evil. My God is able. Come on, if you believe that, God praise Him all over this building right now. Change your song and change your message. If you don't like the report you've got, change the song that you're singing. Hello? Come on now. We change the song, then God changes the message. They began to sing, the harpists began to play, and the Bible says that the Spirit of the Lord then came upon Elisha, and Elisha just flat out just drops out this crazy phrase. This is what he said. This is what the Lord says. Make this valley full of ditches. We've got a valley in the middle of a wilderness and God says to the prophet, dig some holes in it. <laughs> We've got a valley in the middle of the desert. It hasn't rained there for a hundred years and the prophet says, dig some holes. Get ready. He said, you won't hear the rain, so you won't see the rain, you won't hear the wind, but this time tomorrow, this valley is gonna be filled with water. And if the water is gonna do any good to you at all, then make this valley full of ditches. He said, listen, your circumstances might look one way, but I want you to make the valley full of ditches. You might be looking at what's going on in the natural and think death is around the corner, but I'm here to tell you an abundance of water is about to drop into your lap. You might be looking at your life and thinking there's no way this situation can turn around, but I'm here to tell you, get ready for the greatest blessing you've ever received. Oh my gosh. This prophet is speaking to a group of dehydrated soldiers who haven't lapped water for seven days. And in the middle of their desperation and their anxiety and their willingness to quit and to breathe their last breath under the desert sun, he said, make that valley full of ditches. And I just believe that there's somebody in the service. I believe that God's speaking over audacious, that we're looking at the next season of what this church is called to do. And we're not looking at the natural and we're not called to look at what's going wrong in our lives. We're approaching the beginning of a new year and we're not looking at what God has done in the past or what we're facing right now. We're gonna lift high our hearts and our hands towards heaven and be willing to hear His Word. And this I believe is what God's saying to us. Make your valley full of ditches. Get ready for the greatest things you've ever seen to take place. Get ready for God's blessing to flow across your life. Get ready for abundance of rain. Get ready for a prophet 
effort of outpouring of souls. Get ready for miraculous provision. Get ready for new services to be filled. Get ready for new campuses to launch. Get ready for new buildings to be built. Get ready for lives to be turned around. Get ready. Make this valley full of ditches. That's what God's saying. Make the valley full of ditches. Make the valley full of ditches. We're here to celebrate one year of this church, but I believe that God has got something greater ahead for us in the next few years than what we've seen in our lives thus far. Hello? I mean, literally, literally, they're out there in the middle of the wilderness and God is saying to them, make the valley full of ditches. Make the valley full of ditches. Made the valley full of ditches and a worn out group of people are being commanded to align their behavior with God's promise. Let me ask you a question. In your life, would you be more surprised by God's blessing or by your destruction? Would, you, would it appear more likely to you that everything in your life is about to fall apart? If everything did fall apart, would you feel like that's natural? Or would you be more surprised and feel more natural if God was just to abundantly bless your life? Which would be the one that would seem most right to you? Because for many believers, they're expecting more that their life is gonna fall apart and feel more comfortable with it than they do live their lives in a state of expectation that God's got greater things ahead. Am I talking to anybody? We gotta do some action. We're gonna make this valley full of ditches. A worn out group of soldiers are commanded by the prophet. Dig, use your last piece of energy, not for conservation, but for expectation. Use what little you have left to get ready for the rain rather than hoping that you can last a little longer. Use what little, little mustard of seed of faith you have to dig a hole in the ground and get ready for God's blessing, you'd be better to do that than just hang on for dear life. I came here to tell somebody in this room that God hasn't finished with you, God hasn't done on the journey of your life, that He's got a greater day ahead for you, that goodness is going to follow you all the days of your life, that your God is able and your God is on your side and healing is in His wings and turnarounds are going to happen for people. Our God is great. And if you believe it, stand to your feet and give that God some praise all over this place.